Next thing in macro. I guess it's an assignment. I don't know. Anyway, remember on the syllabus uh, that I said that there's going to be some free points. Uh, let's see. There are two optional assignments, Excel Business Cycle Simulation Model and an in-class worksheet, each worth five points that will be included in your final course grade calculation if and only if they improve your score. It's impossible for them to not improve your score, but I put that in there to, to calm fears. Um, if you do one, then your grade is calculated out of 95 points. If you do both, then it's calculated out of 100 points, right? So basically, each one adds five to the numerator and the denominator of your grade. So if your grade was currently uh, 35 out of 40, it would then be 40 out of 45, which is uh, absolutely going to be a higher percentage. So I'm not sure why I said that. Well, again, I, it, I have people worry about stuff like that. So we're about to do the first one. So if you want to follow along, then please do so. But this guarantees you a free five points. And let me tell you where I got this idea. So some guy, well, not some guy. I know who it was. Uh, good Lord, my head's big. Uh, let, let's uh, I go back further or go closer. Further or closer. Okay, uh, that was fun. Turn this light on. All right. Uh, there was somebody presenting a paper. Uh, well, not a paper. Uh, wh wh when we hired Dr. Nikar, uh, we had three candidates. And one of the candidates did a presentation in Dr. Fike's macro class uh, using, you know, doing a sort of neoclassical model and saying, uh, putting it all together, uh, well, he didn't, but he said in class, he puts it in an Excel spreadsheet. And I thought, oh my God, that's perfect. Because the post-Keynesian approach, or the, the typical neoclassical approach is that the economy comes to an equilibrium point and stops, all right? But the post-Keynesian view is that it's much more dynamic, that there's always fluctuations in internal business cycle, as you already know. So um, this right here gives you the impression that post-Keynesian economics is move to a resting point and stop. And unfortunately, you know, I did tell you the story about when the um, agent's expectations are disappointed uh, and then that causes a rise in investment, or I'm sorry, it would be a fall in that case, wouldn't it? Uh, I told you all that, but we really didn't have a model to show it. And so I became obsessed uh, one Christmas break, last Christmas break, to figuring out how to do in Excel and for a post-Keynesian model, what he had done for uh, his neoclassical model in class. And actually, let me go back to something that I just showed you a short time ago. It's really from the Contending Perspectives class. Exam three. And yeah, I showed you this a little bit of it the other day, but well, it might be today, for all I know, you might be watching it all at once. Uh, but if we go here, this is the system dynamics modeling. If we go here to Steve Keen's paper, here's all these equations, and then he plugs them in a model, and he gets these patterns, all right? That's what I want to do. Uh, so there's a couple of goals here. One is to show you what an actual post-Keynesian uh, analysis would look like, because it's going to be a dynamic model. It's not going to be an equilibrium, a series of equations that lead to an equilibrium point. It's going to be a dynamic model. Another is that uh, I always do our senior survey, graduating senior survey every semester, and one of the, the, the uh, comments that students make every now and then is, I wish I'd learned more Excel. Well, first of all, you can. Uh, the business school has set something up to where you can go and, and, and be certified in Excel if you want to. But that doesn't mean you get any practice in class. So this is not a massive amount of practice. But I guarantee you, if you bring up in a job interview, um, have you ever used Excel? Well, I, I, I did once build a model of the economy that, that demonstrated the business cycle in Excel, but no, nothing other than that. Uh, unless there's someone else from this class interviewing, no one is going to give that answer. No one is going to say they built a model of the macro economy uh, in Excel. So. It'll give you something, and, and, and th little things like that can make a big difference because when you've got 100 resumes to look through and you're sitting through 100 interviews, you're looking for reasons to throw someone out and you're looking for reasons why someone stands out. Sorry, I'm drinking my cup of tea after dinner. All right, so I put this together. Actually, it's forthcoming in a paper, too. Um, I, I wrote it up for a journal. 
And uh, what I want to do here is I'm going to go through it step by step and you can follow along. And so here's the goal. You want to end up at the end of this video having created an Excel spreadsheet with the same stuff on it that I've got, all right? And then you're going to email it to me. And when you email it to me, I'm going to give you five points, assuming, of course, that you did it properly, but I don't know why it would be improper if you sat here and did it with me. So. I'm going to be over here at the computer. And by the way, I also decided, uh, usually when I do this in class, uh, I make sure I've practiced it. And I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to practice. I'm going to show that the instructions are written up well enough to where you can figure this out as you go along. All right? That, that my, my instructions are... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should go back here. All right. So go to our webpage for our class. Let, let's zoom in on this a little bit more effectively. Let me get behind the camera here. I'd like to get as much of that on there as I can since it's going to be... Actually, it turned out to be a blessing that I lost my room upstairs because this is much better for being able to show stuff on uh, the computer screen. Okay, there we go. Let's see now. Are there any unfortunate glares from the various lights that are on? I don't see any. Okay, so there's the web page for our class. Remember how you get there. You just go to www.johnterrenceharvey.com and it will take you to the web page where I have all of my classes. johnterrenceharvey.com. There's all my classes. Intermediate Macro and Excel Business Cycle Simulation. Optional, due April 16th by 11.59, of course, Central Time. Um, and, and that's still true, all right? So it's still gonna be due on April 16th. There's no point in changing that date. Um, now, here's how it starts off. And let me go over here and look at the monitor again. I wish it was closer to where I was sitting. and see how legible that is. Let's zoom in on that, because this is gonna be important here. Oh, I'm an idiot. I don't have to do that. All I gotta do is increase the size on the screen. Okay, so let's do that here. Ah, that's what I wanted over there, actually. Let me reset this. Reset. That's what I wanted. Okay. Um, Keynes argued that fluctuations in the investment created the business cycle, as you know from exam two and that it was the difference between expected and actual profits combined with the panic that emerges in an uncertain world that is the root cause. Michael Kolesky expanded on this. Now, we didn't talk about how Michael Kolesky expanded on this, but he did. Kolesky wrote a bunch of stuff on the business cycle, and i got to tell you, a lot of this is pulled from Kolesky. So, a simulation can be created in just a few steps. First, the variables. So, what the uh, instructions do first is go through and explain what all the variables are. All right, here's the theoretical model. We have two exogenous variables, two variables that we're just going to say, eh, let's say that number's 10, uh, let's say that number's 15, right? And then the endogenous ones will be generated within the system. The exogenous variables will be the target stock of physical capital that firms believe will be sufficient to meet market demand at an acceptable profit. For example, if we are restaurateurs, then there's going to be a certain number of restaurants, and we're going to be measuring it in dollar values, of course, but a certain number of restaurants where we believe, okay, well, that, that's all that we could possibly build and still be profitable in Fort Worth, that adding one more restaurant is going to cut into the profits and one of them is going to have to shut down. Right? So, the, so there's some target level that entrepreneurs have, we're assuming. There's also a rate at which physical capital must be replaced to maintain the same level of profitability. Now, this doesn't mean that it has to wore out. It can do, but that, um, uh, you know, indeed, uh, that every often will not be the case. Sorry. <laughs> Very often will not be the case, but that's the easiest way to think about it. It could also be that just uh, uh, technology has changed and you need to update your... Well, when TCU redid all their dorms after the internet became really a big deal. You had to have, uh, first of all, they had to put um, ethernet cable in the dorms and then they ended up doing wireless. Uh, and so even though the dorm wasn't necessarily worn out, it was no longer competitive with dorms at SMU. So they had to fix them up. All right, so we're gonna make these variables up. We're gonna say, hey, let's just say it's this. Hey, let's just say it's this. These are gonna be determined within the model. God, this is exciting. I never had anything like this when I was in class. You're going to build a model that's going to show fluctuations in the macro economy. All right. D sub T is going to be the decision. Now, this is very Koleski in here. 
because Koleski made a big deal out of separating the decision to invest and the actual investment. So, for example, you might decide in January, hey, let's build a new restaurant, but you might not start till March or April, right? So there's a gap between the decision and the actual starting to build it. And then there's a gap between starting to build it and it actually being finished, all right? So Koleski made a big deal out of that when he was explaining the business cycle. We're going to make a little deal out of it here. D sub T is merely the decision made in period T. It's just the decision regarding how much to invest in period T sub 1, all right? So it'd be like uh, we're deciding in, actually, I, I, the way I put it together was uh, I, I, I was implying that it was a quarterly model, all right? So uh, in first quarter, you decide how much you're going to invest, and this is physical investment, in uh, second quarter. I sub T is gross private domestic investment in period T, all right? So uh, D sub T would lead to I sub T plus 1 because that would be the investment in the next period. The K sub T is the total stock of capital, which we've already had on the Davidson graph. It's the total dollar value of all existing restaurants or whatever. Now, here's where the problem's going to be. Pi sub T is the actual level of profit in period T. And pi sub t with the superscript e is going to be the expected level of profit in period t. And of course, what's going to happen is those are going to differ and it's going to cause uh, uh, different reactions on the part of the investor. There's going to be a panic condition, a condition triggered when actual profits fall short of expected profits by some predetermined amount. We'll, we'll, we'll determine that amount here in just a second. All right, so those are all the variables in the model. Then we've got the equations. And this comes straight from Koleski. This right here is Koleski saying, uh, remember on study question number, I don't know what number it was. Um, let me pull it up right here. Remember this study question. Oh, I might already have it open. I do. Excellent. That's the inflation stuff on exam two. Here we go. Here we go. There. Study question number 93. Look, profits equal investment, all right? Remember the, the, the calculation that we made that it turns out that in any time period, <clears throat> pardon me, there's a very high correlation. Hang on. <coughs> I remember my first cup of tea. Um, <clears throat> between investment and profit. And we are going to say that they are equal, which is what we determined in that other study question. So investment in period T is the same thing as profit in period T. And then basically what happened was the investment spending generated the profits. Now, what people expect profits to be is what they actually were last quarter. Uh, this is coming from one of Keynes's uh, statements that for the most part people just assume that existing conditions are going to continue unless there's some compelling reason to believe otherwise. So uh, the what we expect in period T is a continuation of what happened in period T minus one. Stock of capital. The stock of capital this quarter is equal to what it was last quarter minus any depreciation plus any new investment. So uh, really no different than what we talked about with the Davidson graph, although we're laying it out differently here. Uh, the stock of capital in period T is equal to whatever it was in period T minus 1, minus how much wore out, all right? So th this expression right here, the, the KT minus 1 uh, minus KD is going to be, well, that's how much was left over after the last quarter was done, because some of the stuff wore out. Plus, we did new investment, all right? Uh, so this period's total capital is equal to last period's minus depreciation plus any new building. All right, panic. Panic is going to be a function of, all right, this, this is a functional form here rather than a, a, a deterministic equation like this. It's going to be a function of the difference between what actually happened and what was expected. If this number is positive, then that's a good thing because actual profits were higher than expected. If it's negative, then it's a bad thing. And uh, what the bad thing is, let's see here, uh, what the, 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 the bad, you know, the amount of badness, uh, if you will, uh, is going to be determined in the later equation here. Uh, let's see, let me skip down to six because it's really easy and then we'll, we'll, we'll struggle through five right there. Uh, six is saying that investment in period T, I already mentioned this up above, 
is whatever you decided it was going to be back in period t minus 1, all right? But what did you decide? What did you decide back in period t? What were you thinking about doing next quarter? Well, part of it was, and let me slide back up so you can see what that variable was, your target stock of capital, all right? You have in mind a target stock of capital you want to get to. So how much you're going to invest next period depends on, let me move the cursor there, totally ignore that PNC variable for a second. The how much you're going to invest next period is the difference between your target and where you are right now. So let's say your target is $100 million worth of restaurants, but currently you're at $90 million. Well, then how much you want to build next period? $10 million. Let me say it again. If that's $100 million, ignore the PNC. If that's $100 million, and that's $90 million, that's $10 million. How much do you want to add to the stock of capital? Well, I want to add however much is necessary to get us from where we are now to where I want to be. Now, it's also going to be the case as we get into the model here that we're going to say that firms can't build all they want at once, but that is what they want. They'd like to get to K star, uh, but they might not be able to get all the way there in one time period, but that's what they're thinking. Now, the panic variable here is a sudden adjustment to what my target is. Let's say that in this period, I discovered that the uh, profits were not what I thought they were going to be. Well, crap. All right, so now I panic. And the panic is sort of a dollar value subtraction from where I want to be. Because I no longer want to be there. All right? I panicked. Profits were a lot lower than I expected this time period. So even though, generally speaking, I want to get to K star, I'm adjusting that this uh, quarter because I panicked. Something bad happened. And I no longer want to. So, so what, what, I was using an example of what? 100, 100 million here? Uh, that could be 20 million. So 100 million minus 20 million is going to be 80 million. That's your new target. Your target is adjusted by whether or not there's panic on the part of economic agents. Now, I could have also included euphoria on the part of economic agents, but it, it gave the same outcome and it was more complicated, so I didn't. So, so I didn't look at what happens when profits are much higher than you expected. I only looked at what happens when profits are much lower than you expected. Sorry, I am now done with my tea. All right, underlying logic. Okay, so it says here, and let me see if I've pushed off the page over here on the monitor. Nope, I'm right. It says here, I'm going to end up explaining all the relationships twice. Here and in the section where I'm laying out the Excel model, but that's okay. Because you'd rather have that than not understand something. All right, now here are the, uh, um, the, the explanations of the stuff that just happened up above. Well, I guess I kind of gave that. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of slide through this fairly quickly. Um, the first equation, based on the Koleskian idea, I already told you that. The second thing, I already told you about the, the, the Keynes' concept of uncertainty, where uh, you think that whatever's happening yesterday is going to continue to happen today. I already told you that. Uh, that I already told you all about that. So we now have a greater explanation there, too, if you want. Panic thing. Already told you that. Already told you that. So those are just the explanations that I just gave you. Um, and you can have them right there, too, if you want to sit and read through them rather than watch the video. All right. Notable simplification, simplifications. This take, Of course, it's a model. So as a model, it's going to be a simplification. Um, this takes a number of shortcuts. For example, we have totally abstracted away uh, from the manner in which firms would estimate their target uh, stock of capital. Uh, we just said, eh, it's so-and-so. We never change it. It's going to be the same the whole way through. We have taken no account of other variables that may affect investment spending, like interest rates. Right? Uh, and there is no change in population. So over time, I think we're going to do, uh, I, guess, I think, 50 time periods? I can't think now. So 50 quarters. Uh, and we have completely omitted the financial sector, although we're going to add it in later. Right? Now, but, because the, but the goal here is to see how few assumptions it takes to generate the instability that Keynes and Koleski believed existed. Furthermore, all the factors we omitted are likely to actually just contribute to that and not, not, not dampen it. All right, but wait, there's more. It's actually very easy to set all this up in Excel, so do so. Now, I, got a, I had a good idea this semester, well, I guess before the semester started. I thought, hey, uh, in my original instructions, I was telling people, type all this out. 
And then I thought, why don't I just give you that to start with? So when you click on this, it will give you this much of the Excel spreadsheet already. It's already labeled for you, so, so that's kind of handy. So first tip, I'm gonna make your column headings. The rest of the directions will be easy, easier to follow if you choose the same cell addresses as I did, or to make life even easier, click here and you'll have an Excel file with the headings already added. So I'm gonna do that now as if I were a student, as if I did not already have a college degree. Click, and there it was, it downloaded down there in the bottom left. Um, now let's see, is that on the screen? Yes it is, excellent, okay, so it's on the bottom left down there. So I'm gonna click on that and of course it's gonna open Excel. And voila, there you already have, that, that was French by the way, you already have what I said you would have, that's not it. Let me delete some of this stuff that I'm not actually using. Okay, I said you would have that, right? Oops. <laughs> well, now you do. All right, so you're not going to have to, oh, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, you're not going to have to type all that up yourself, so that, that saves quite a bit of trouble. All right, so now you're going to have to go back and forth between windows. Uh, you're going to have to go back and forth between the instructions and this. You can set them up side by side if you want to. Maybe I'll try that for now since there aren't too many columns but I don't want to make it too small for you to read. That's going to end up being too small, isn't it? Slide this over a bit. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to make them large enough to read and they're going to sort of overlap each other and I'll just kind of jump back and forth like that. That might still be easier than having them taking up the whole page. Let me walk over here and have a look at the monitor and see, yeah, that should be fine, that should be fine. All right, so, all right. So, now let's read these instructions. Nah, screw it, let's make them, let, let's maximize those windows and just do this. I have marked in purple cells where you need to input some values for constants in the model. Put 43,000 in cell D3, now let's do that. Cell D3 is right there. And if you want to, you can put in here, oh good lord, here it is, here it is. Click, make it a dollar value. You can click on that dollar sign right here under number, and it will make that a dollar value. And I don't know, it, it feels a little better to do that. By the way, I didn't make up all these numbers. Uh, I, I looked in uh, data for the United States, and gosh, I wish I could tell you what the time period was now. Um, it's in the paper. Uh, that I wrote related to this, but uh, I'm, these data are as close as I can figure what they would be for the United States over that time period. So these aren't just sort of random numbers. I thought it'd be more interesting if we had some numbers that were closer to uh, real life. Uh, and of course those are, oh, I, I've said all that, and now I don't know what the, uh, what the um, units are. I don't know if that's uh, billions. I, sus I suspect it's billions. Here, I'll show you my subdirectory with research, active projects, uh, let's see here, not that one. Dynamic modeling for intermediate macro. All right, and here's the final, I, I, I just sent in, gosh, not but 19 days ago, uh, the last revision of this uh, paper. So this is where I'm laying out for other professors how to do this in their class. And somewhere in here, there is a, oh, that's right. This journal makes you put all the, uh, well, most of them do actually, but put all the footnotes at the end. Uh, so let's see here. Taco Capital, no, no, no. Um, I'm gonna put in United States, Control F, United. Let's just do United. Data source. Uh, I don't remember, I'll, I'll look for, I don't wanna make you sit here and wait, wait for all this, um, but uh, hang on, I wanna do one more thing. I imagine I would have used the word period. From the period so-and-so to so-and-so. Uh, down, down. Oh, I use the word period a lot. Here it is. Um, based on US economic data for the period 1990 to 2014. All right, so that's what this is based on. These numbers are, are uh, 
roughly what you would have found for the United States from 2014, uh, from, from uh, I forgot what I said now, what was it, 1990 to 2014? Whatever it was, somewhere in that range. Uh, now, so we got 43,000 there. Now let's take the next step. It says put 1,200 in, in uh, F3. F3, one, two, zero, zero. And now let's hit the dollar sign. So now it's 1,200, okay. Put 300 in cell I3. I3, oh, I'm sorry, that's I2. Oh, did I skip something? Yes, I did, 100 in I2, sorry. 100, and let's make that, and then what did I say, 300? I'll type it and then I'll go back and check. 300 in I3. Okay, those are the target stock of capital. So in D3 was that K star. That's what firms want to get to in aggregate. They want to get to 43. Oh, and I forgot to look at the units, didn't I? I, I suspect it's um, it got to be billions so that it's 43 trillion. But I'll look that up in just a second because now it bothers me. Uh, and um, the, let's see. Rate of depreciation is in F3. KD is how fast stuff wears out, which is what? Uh, oh, <laughs> I got up and looked at the, at, the, at the TV like I was gonna see it over there. 1,200, so stuff wears out 1,200 uh, a quarter, or you know, 1,200 billions a quarter. And um, now here's the panic stuff. What it's saying in F3 is that, well, uh, F3 and I2. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, 100 and I2. Uh, and that is how much the gap has to be between actual and expected profits for people to panic, all right? I2, that 100 and I2, which I'll show you again here, that 100 in I2, the panic gap, is how much it has to vary before people panic. And when they do panic, they adjust by 300. They're gonna lower the K star by 300. All right, I'm about to go, go into some of this to make it more obvious. All right, uh, let's see. Expected profits, okay, next we need some initial values. Put 1200 under I for the first period investment. And then what I mean by that is one, two, zero, zero. Right there. First period investment. 1,200. Because we don't know what we don't we don't have a previous quarter's decision to look at. We're just gonna have to go with uh, uh, it turns out that in the previous period they must have decided to invest twelve hundred, so this period they're investing twelve hundred. Then forty thousand under K, we are bringing forward that much in the stock of capital. And we want 1,200 under expected profits. All right, another dollar sign in there. Control S, go ahead and save that so I don't end up losing it. Now let's see, let's double check here and see where we stand. Along the rest of row six, input these formulas. Now, get this. Copy. It doesn't always copy and paste neatly, so be careful about this, but I'm gonna try to copy and paste what I have in D6, uh, what I should have in D6. Let's, let's paste this in here. D6, Control V. Hey, it worked, all right. Um, and that is, let's go back and look at that. And that is the gap between the stock of capital that firms believe will be sufficient to meet market demand at an acceptable profit and the actual current stock of capital. It is therefore what they hope to build next term, uh, ne next period as investment. Well look, we've got, they want to get to 43,000, but they're at 40, so how much do they want to build? Three, they want to build 3,000. So that's all that is. This one is, this sell address minus this cell, but this cell address is fixed. That's why it has the dollar signs there. It means always use D3. The dollar sign D, dollar sign three, locks it into D3. Whereas C6, on the next line here, it's actually gonna be 
C7, C, uh, um, you should do it over here, I guess. C7, C8, C9 uh, for that equation because it's going to be referencing different numbers over here. So uh, I don't know how much you know about Excel, probably more than I do. But that's why we did that. So now let's go in for the next one. And this is actual profits. Control C. This is going to go in E6. And I think I'm going to slide it over a little bit. 1,200. Remember that Koleski says that profits in any period will be equal to investment in that period. So all this cell right here is, is B6. That's whatever investment was. So this cell over here will always be identical to this cell over here coming from that Koleski equation we went through in the previous video. All right, next. Let's see here, E6 minus F6, control copy. It goes really quickly once we get all the, uh, all the um, equations in. Control V, uh-oh, that one didn't work so well. E6 minus F6, E6 minus F6. Oh, well it should just be zero. Uh, maybe that's what it does for zero. When it's a dollar value, let's take the dollar value off. Can I? Uh, I don't know. I'm not very good at Excel. I, I use um, Quattro Pro, actually. But I'm going to guess that's zero. And, and we'll find out when we try to run this. You know what I'm going to do? Equals E6 minus F6. Just to make absolutely sure. Okay, I know I put it in right. So there wasn't a problem from copy and pasting. Uh, and that's just the difference between what actually happened and what was expected. And of course, that's where your panic's going to be generated. That, uh, oh my gosh, we expected, you know, uh, we expected 1,500 and we got 1,200. Oh no, uh, what are we going to do now? Then the PNC right there, let's see, am I ready for that one yet? Yeah. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit more complicated, copy, but that's fun. Aha, okay. And I'm not gonna put a dollar sign on that. Well, actually, I guess I could. I, I'll get back to that in a second. I'll tell you why I could. All right. This equation, or, or this cell here, is G6, if, it's an if-then statement, if G6, and that's this one right here, if the amount by which actual profits exceeded expected is less than I2, Less than 100. So in other words, if actual profits fell short of expected by more than 100, right? So it's the same thing. What it's saying here is if G6, if the difference between actual and expected was smaller than negative 100, I could have made that, a ne I, I don't know, I kind of struggled with this. Do I make that a negative number or do I make it a positive number and then subtract it down here? Uh, then, so if this is smaller by... 100 or more, then you have to create this value right here. You plug in this value right here becomes I3, 300. Now, and, and, and let me just say that for now, and, and we'll plug it in as we go through here because I think it'll be more obvious what that, exactly that means as we plug in some more values. Then.